Hi Rob, welcome back to the Stay Hungry podcast. It's Joel and Andy, and today we're talking about unfair Shopify advantages. Andy, it always feels like ages since we last podcast. It's not, it's just a lot happens in a couple of weeks. We're on the pod game now, I think we've got more, more and more episodes getting in the bag now. Hope so. Sorry listeners. Yeah. Even more, even more good stuff about pay-per-click ads and the mindset behind marketing coming, coming your way. And today it's Shopify. I love your radio voice there. Like, coming your way. Oh! <laughs> you buy one, get one free. <laughs> Oh, we can't say that. He's, he's, oh, we can say that. He's not dead. Um, they've gone bust, haven't they? Well, they gave away too many free ones. No, ah, there we go. <laughs> Talk about divisive advertising. Fucking hell. People must have been buying at some point. Well, yeah, absolutely. He just wowed they were me They massive, up. weren't they? They were just on the telly every ad break. When the ads, TV ads, were still getting massive viewings as well. Right? Well, I sent you a picture from one of my favourite TV ads last night, the Hamlet cigar ad is that is that what that comb over's from yeah yeah can you remember can you remember that ad it must have been before my time so he was so so he's trying to scrape like what little hair he has left over the top of his head ready for his photo to get taken in the photo booth but every time the photo the flash goes off strands are just falling over his face so he's just trying to it's oh it was it was massive i wouldn't like to think how many cigars they sell what year do you reckon Oh, uh, 87? So when you ask if I remember it, do you recall anything from the year you were born? Have you born anything? <laughs> Damn me. Rapsy Nesbitt he was, that actor. So actually, I, I, we used to, um, as everyone did, record the Christmas films off the telly. Yeah. And then, so my mum had obviously got excited that she'd had a kid, recorded like Pinocchio and whatnot over the Christmas period. And then I used to watch that as a kid rather than buying the actual film, I guess. And uh, it had all the old ads in it, so it would have, like, um, the old Old Spice ads. It would have... There was an ad... I, th- I think it was for a bank or for mortgages or a credit card of, like, a boy swimming down to get a pearl. I don't know and that it, one. it had, like, Enya in the background or something. It was... Oh, right. Well, back then, you could advertise pretty much anything at any time, I think. You see booze adverts all the time, In beer the day, adverts. Yeah. Hofmeister, Follow the Bear, Carl, Adrian's Carling Back Label. That was on during school programmes, I think. Why was but it called Carling Black Label? Was there a different label? What's it called now? Carling. Oh, right. I think it's just the fact that it was... A black label. Yeah. Not very original. <laughs> Some branding company charged <laughs> the, a fucking fortune. I was going to say, their marketing department <laughs> were flying... <laughs> Love a bit of marketing. Right, anyway, what... What are we yapping about? Yeah, so we're talking about TV ads, but actually we're supposed to be talking about pay-per-click ads, aren't we? Online advertising. Um, well, yeah, I guess... Massive opportunity right now. Yeah, it's particularly for Shopify. So the kind of theme of the podcast today is... Um, you, you may or may not know, listen to this podcast, that during COVID, Shopify skyrocketed. A lot of people tried to set up businesses from their garage or um, storage or... or um, print on demand such and such and many of those businesses don't exist anymore um some of them were hobby businesses or emergency businesses but some of toys pardon sex toys that was a big one in lockdown selling sex toys okay you you speak you speak from experience or i suppose like um three people set up sex toy businesses yeah, yeah I, I think, think it, I learned quite a few things. I, I, th- I think it was like one of those industries that's not regulated and cheap to buy. It's so not. Uh, it's just sell. Bloody hell! Oh, right. Okay. Well, you I'm imported a, from China for like. But yeah, because there was that one. They were they were um, importing what are they call fucking love bullets or something. Right. For like ninety nine p. Sounds like you know a lot about this. <laughs> for ninety nine p and selling them for ten quid, and I was like. Fucking hell, this is amazing. Why doesn't everyone do this? Yeah. yeah well, I guess I, there came a point where everyone had one. Well, yeah. And I suppose they had lots of time on their hands. Um, but anyway, I digress. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, some of those businesses have actually gone on to succeed. And the the to cut the wheat from the chaff, I suppose, it's um, there are certain tactics that they've implemented, be it pay-per-click, be it ads, be it retargeting, be it... Um, 
the way they use their creative, um, the tactics they use to, to drive people in that has stood them out. Because, for example, uh, if anyone's on TikTok, as we all are one way or another, um, the amount of businesses out there that are doing pick and mix on Shopify at the moment and doing well, even though it's relatively small margins, and, and it's because they're nailing their content and nailing their remarketing. Why do so many businesses still not employ remarketing tactics? I don't know what it is, I think. I, th- I think it's, it's tricky for us, and we talk about this a lot. We are entrenched in the marketing side of business, and we find ourselves in circles that only talk about marketing, uh, be that coaches, mentors, marketing agencies, agency gurus, whatever it might be. But I guess you've got to think that there are thousands of businesses out there that um, just don't go near marketing. Marketing's the last thing on their list. Andy's agitated because he can hear certain members of the team on the phone. We have a certain member of the team who's just very loud and they've decided to have a phone call now. So if you can hear someone with like a black cut accent in the yeah. background, that's body. If it sounds like we've been taken over by the Peaky Blinders... Um, all right you need to look at your marketing that's not as good that, that was, was all right wasn't yeah. it can you do that or was that racist uh, well not racist oh, Def- right. definitely uh, frowned upon <laughs> <laughs> so yeah can you do impressions of any accent now probably well you can but it depends if you're being derogatory or not I suppose so look do people still do like funny god do you remember that Scouse comedian he always used to do jokes about the Germans what was his name Stan Boardman? Is this something that was before I was born again? No, well, it's probably Jim Davidson times, and there's probably so, yes. probably a lot of comedians that wouldn't be allowed anywhere near. So they used to work, did he used to do stand up in the working men's clubs? Yes, yeah, social right. clubs, social clubs. Okay, yeah. No. Okay. Anyway, so if you can hear that in the background, that's what's going on. So, so yeah, so so remarketing. Yeah, I guess yeah, we're we're exposed to a lot of marketers, um, but when you speak to people who maybe don't know that much about marketing. Yeah, maybe remarketing is something. Yeah, I mean, you if you think about, if you're listening now, uh, in simple terms, remarketing is when you're marketing to people who've already been exposed to you before. So, could be they've visited your website, could be they've engaged with your social, could be that they've subscribed to your email, could be you've met them at an expo, could be that they've uh, bought one of your products but maybe not from you. So the way you would remarket to them is maybe run a competition on the product or uh, buy the data from the stockist or, or whatever it might be. So there's a number of ways and, and it's getting smarter and smarter all the time. So uh, one of the kind of big early players on digital remarketing was NectarCard. That, okay. that they, they were capturing the data of everything that you bought. And so they could serve you offers based on your behaviour. And they, they, they got a run on everyone. You know, I think Nectar Card was one of the first, and then there's obviously Tesco Club Card, now Morrison Moore Card, there's Co-op Card, whatever. But the, the reason they could give you points and offer you discounts in the future was because the value of that data and the value of the remarketing and the likelihood that you continue to spend with them. And, and you'll see now that, the offers that they do aren't as good as they used to be because everyone's doing it. Yeah. I noticed in, um, but what Sainsbury's are doing now is that rather than price matching or discounting everywhere, you, they'll often sell foods and it will give you one price, but it will also give you a price that if you buy it via your Nectar card. So basically still encouraging you to get a Nectar card and to use it. So yeah. it's three quid or if you're a Nectar card holder, you get it for two fifty. Yeah, you don't get the deals in Tesco without a club card now. You just don't. No, really. Yeah. They're all doing it then. Yeah. Um, I don't go to Tesco's. Do Aldi that? and Little do cards? Don't. Th- um, I don't think so. I don't know. I, I they mean, must be doing something to capture I, user behaviour. I don't think they do. Really? Because we shop in Aldi. Should we give them a call? Ghostbusters. See if they need help hand of their remarketing. But yeah, so even something like email marketing, that is remarketing. You've got you've got um, someone's data and you'll send them emails to stay in front of them. But yeah. Again, it's it's fucking mind boggling how many business owners we speak to who have got a database and they never fucking communicate with it. Yeah, and like you know, MailChimp now, keep 
Active Campaign, Go High Level, all these platforms out there offer dynamic content as well. So you can you can get the email to personalize itself based on someone's behavior. So if someone's been tagged in, like in this case, if someone's been tagged in your database, Shopify, you could send out, like we could send out an email about your top tips for digital advertising on your, and that word at the end, if it's if they're someone that signed up via a Shopify funnel, on your Shopify, if they signed up via a Squarespace campaign on your Squarespace, so that it feels like the content is dynamic and personal mm-hmm. to them, mm-hmm. and you can do that with ads as well. So like the Meta platform now, the Google platform learns the user behavior and serves them the creative that they know will best resonate with them. And people just don't realize that you can do that. So what about the skeptics out there who say, no, no, you can't trust the AI, you should do everything manually, you should input all the different bits of copy and the images and test everything yourself. And Yeah. Because Facebook, or is, is Facebook going to serve them, going to look after themselves first? Or are they actually doing that because the more that we get, the more that they get. It, it's a halfway house, I'd say. So the the platforms are, are never going to get it a hundred percent right. But if you think a human is, you're having mm. a giraffe. Mm. So it's you should always A B test certain things. So you might be A B testing headlines. You might be A B testing long copy versus short copy. You might be A B testing a text based image versus a friendly face. Strongest heart in the animal kingdom, the the giraffe. Okay. Just in reference to your giraffe comment. Okay. And I thought that's a fun. Is fact. that is that true? I'm pretty sure it is, and not just because. Well, I presume part of it is because it's got such a fucking long neck. A blue whale heart must be. Well, that's what I think. I, I was thinking about a blue whale, but I'm sure I've read that a giraffe's heart because it's got a pump it's got it all the way. Yeah. Maybe that's a pound for pound thing. That wouldn't be as impressive. Or land animal. Land animal. There we go. Okay, now I'll tell you what. We're, we're, we're dangerous in a pub quiz. Shit at marketing. We're, <laughs> we're sharing so much knowledge today. <laughs> David Attenborough will be shitting himself. Um, um, right, second move advantages. Yeah. Wanky marketing alert. Um, what's that then, Joel? Basically, if you're getting into Shopify now, you're not the first person to do it. So being a second mover gives you an advantage because you can learn from the mistakes others have already made. Um, like it. And basically you're shortcutting the time it takes to learn you're not having to do all the testing and measuring there will already be data out there that tells you what headlines work and what headlines don't for most industries there will already be data out there that tells you what creative works and what doesn't for most industries there will be tutorials out there that will tell you how to photograph your product for best results there will be um numerous themes for Shopify that perform better and get you a better conversion rate than the basic free ones. So that's what second mover advantage is. What I'd say we tend to find is 50% of the businesses that approach us are trying to reinvent the wheel. Right. And 50% of the businesses that approach us are looking for the magic pill. And the magic pill ones are easier to deal with because you can say, well, look, this is all the things that everyone else does that works. It, it, it's not going to be a miracle, but this is this is your best mm-hmm. course of action. The reinvent the wheel ones are really difficult because they're trying to say that everyone that's gone before them must be wrong. And occasionally one of those people is right. So the like Henry Fords of this world or the Elon Musks of this world turn around and like, fuck the way everyone else has done it, I'm going to mm-hmm. do it this way. But chances are you're not one of them. And so if you're approaching a marketing company to get your Shopify campaign going, and you're saying something like, I want to do something no one else has ever done before, expect the bill to be really high right. because okay. you, you're asking someone to create something that's never happened before. And I think, moving away from Shopify, but if you think about like the John Lewis Christmas ad, They've got that. They've got themselves in that trap that every year they have yeah. to try and see what you did there. I didn't do it on purpose, oh, but okay. I, I could get to that. Couldn't it is I? that one, isn't it? The Venus, the Venus fly, fly trap. trap. Yeah, yeah I, I don't like this year's one. Um, but I can see how they've ended up in that predicament because they've just got to a point where it's like, well, and now they're up against. I mean, everyone's doing it. The Aldi advert, unbelievable. Um, I was watching the Asda one. 
So Michael Bublé, one thing, but it's directed by fucking Taiki Wahiti or whatever his name is. Is it? And it's like, fucking hell, so they've now got Marvel directors directing the Asda Christmas. So it's like, the bar's just going, you know, I remember a time, got fucking sound really old now, where the John Lewis thing, it was almost just that, that innocent uh, excitement. But well, now, even prior to that, just the Coca-Cola lorry coming on yeah, TV yeah. meant it was Christmas. But I mean, the, the Christmas ad started like the beginning of November now. And so it's almost like seeing the John Lewis ad in the middle of November just feels really Oh, just you've, feels hit, really you've weird. hit an age. I'm sure they never used to launch in that early on. Really? Six weeks out. See, I, I'm struggling with this at the minute because I, I, I love Christmas. Um, and I promise we will get back onto the topic. But like, I, love, I love Christmas and I love the idea of Christmas and spending time with family and just like the fact that a lot of people take part. But given that it's relatively mild outside, it's a bit soggy and doesn't feel particularly wintry. When you get home and half of the TV shows that are on are Christmas themed, and you're like, "Well, it's the twentieth of November or whatever." Some we know has already got their tree up. Really? They had it like a week ago. Yeah, I'm not on board with that. But so we we've given in. We bought a fake tree now, um, like a couple of years ago. So we couldn't put our real tree up really early because obviously it'd be dead by Christmas. But now. We can put it up whenever, so I think we're going to put it up like around my birthday, which is around the beginning of December. Yeah, see, my my wife's birthday is on the twentieth, so she doesn't like Christmas to compete. Well, you don't put your tree up to the twenty first. No, then? normally, no, it has gone up before then, but it's just we don't make too much of a fuss about Christmas till her birthday's out of the way. Because I think she was like one of those kids, Shopify stores, listen up, um, where people were like, "Oh, this is for your Christmas and, and birthday. Your birthday," and she was like, "Fuck's sake, that's annoying." Like, I'm the fourth of December. If anyone's it's like just, watching, just far something. enough out. Yeah, yeah. Apart from apart from the really tight relatives, and they would still combine the presents. Would they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I see, haven't. I'm May, so if someone combines my present, yeah, they're getting yeah, a find yeah, out. But yeah, but, but I mean, you know, talk about ads, Christmas ads or online ads. The pressure's on. That you know what you what you used to be able to get amazing results from six months ago, a year ago. Things are changing. Social media platforms are allegedly trying to make it easier for anyone to be able to get decent enough results on their ads. I'm not talking about amazing results, but maybe halfway decent results. So it's you mentioned Henry Ford earlier. You've, you've just always got to be learning. Otherwise, you will get left yeah. behind. If, if you run a great Shopify ad campaign, works really well, but you're not in that campaign regularly looking at all the relative the, the relevant numbers, then at some point, guess what? Your pound won't be working as yeah. well as it would have been. And there's no, like, not literally not thinking of any individuals but there's an element of entitlement that's been born out of a false narrative with digital advertising that meta ads and google ads have been some of the most underpriced ads in the last 10 years do you mean they're charging more now Joe? It, well they're charging oh. they're charging more and you could still argue they're underpriced because you try and buy advertising space in the commercials at this time of year or you try and buy advertising space on a billboard at this time of year and bang for your buck you'll you'll be paying a lot more than you're paying for meta or google ads or tiktok ads or you know and what people have got comfortable with is the idea that they'll make a return on ad spend on the first purchase and that's not always going to be true like if you sell a widget for 300 quid you should be looking to make a return on ad spend on first purchase that pick and mix store that i mentioned before Mm. are probably not making any money on the first purchase but what they are doing is then using that purchase to create content to generate five more purchases, and yeah. then all of those purchases they're in they're in the black sort of thing. So mm. things certainly have changed. I remember reading the Four Hour Work Week. I mean, maybe when it first came out, a long time ago now, um, pre big social media kickoff. So he was talking about the return from Google Ads back then, and he was saying if you're if you want to earn some more money, run a side hustle, do e commerce invest in google ads but you should be looking to earn 10 pounds for every pound you spend on google ads yeah and those are the days and for some businesses they can still get that and you know we've got clients who are getting a 10 to 1 return on their shopify ads but generally speaking it, it basically it fucking is nowhere near as easy as it was back in the day oh i mean yeah we we work with a mentor who added over fifty thousand people to his database at less than a pound a lead 
that's not in in his space in business mentorship space that would be that would be tough no Lee's it's hard isn't it with it so say if you're not in the e-commerce business you are no b2b and and you want your ads to gather leads sometimes you think shit well i'm paying 30 quid for a lead and this lead hasn't given me any money well that's the game you're in that lead could buy for you tomorrow it could be next week if you never communicate with him or her they'll never buy for you but it could take a year we've had people buy off us after they've been in our funnel for two years and just because that lead cost you 20 quid that's an investment that building your database an investment you're not going you're probably not going to make a return on that quickly but once you've got that lead in your database it doesn't cost yeah. you anything to nurture it and and everyone's focused on lead generation but they're not focusing on lead nurturing yeah and like you're to sort of expand on that if you if the lifetime value of a client for you is 10 grand and you're working at a 30 percent margin so there's three grand profit in that 10 grand for you you need to ask yourself how much would i be willing to spend to make three mm -hmm. grand and what we repeatedly see businesses fail to do is build that into their margin so if lifetime you know i would say if the lifetime value of a client is 10 grand and you've only and i use only loosely got a 30 percent margin you need to consider that you're going to have to spend a grand to acquire that customer but you're not just going to have to spend a grand to acquire that customer. You have to spend a grand and maybe 12 months. Yeah. yeah. And so it's what you do now that will impact the, how effective your business is in 12 months' time. I mean, I just had a conversation with one of our team. He was talking about um, a, type of, a type of Google ad called Promax. And he was saying that we had a client come on board, no names mentioned, who... I'd never run Google ads before, so they'd got no Google history. Google wasn't able to optimize because they'd never had any spend. It took six months for Google to get to a place where it understood the audience. And now they're regularly getting conversions and it's paying them back handsomely. But I know there'll be people listening to this podcast right now that just haven't got six months. And you've got to be realistic about what time horizon you're working on and what you're willing to spend to acquire a customer. And both matter. And the business that's willing to wait the longest and spend the most will always win. Well, I talk about this a lot, that um, if you're going to explore a new avenue of marketing, or sorry, an avenue of marketing that's new for you, do your due diligence. But then you've got to give it a year. So yeah. whether that's, look, I want to launch a podcast, I want to launch Facebook ads, I want to invest in SEO, whatever it might be, you go do your due diligence and go all in but be prepared to wait 12 months you can't turn up to one networking meeting didn't not get any business and say that's a load of shit i'm never networking again yeah. you've got to turn up week in week out for a year build that know like and trust and then the sales should come and but not many business like, owners will wait that long a podcast is a great example of that because see, trying to see a tangible return from podcast unless you've got a big sponsor mm -hmm. is borderline impossible because we're not like I'm not going to get to the end of this episode and say for fifty percent off our Shopify ads, put this code in on every episode. It's, it's we can sell all those love bullets we got. The <laughs> but the the thing that I know about the podcast is after about a year of doing it, the the key thing about every new client that we got that was a great fit was that they said, "Oh, I listened to a couple of episodes of your podcast," and now three years in. I probably get one or two screenshots a week of someone saying, oh, I loved what you said in this episode, or I know who you were talking about. In the, I got that this morning. I know who you were talking about in this episode. And like, it's a screenshot, so I'm not, I'm not certain what episode it is. And I just went back, you're going to have to remind me. And then they say, oh, I'm sure you were talking about so-and-so when you said this. And I wasn't, but it's, it's, uh, it's funny. Um, the podcast is certainly something that loads of people want to do. Um, there's a bit of fear about the technical equipment involved. And to be honest, we started with a phone and a little plug-in microphone. That was it. But it's a dedication to turn up and do an episode once a week, once a fortnight, for, for again, at least a year. And I mean, even at one point, we had this massive fucking frame that we'd hang a brick wall off. Oh, shit, I've forgotten about A vinyl that. brick wall. And then we'd sit at the vinyl brick wall like we were like graffiti artists. Bloody hell, I've totally forgotten about that. And one. record an episode. But it's even the same with, with Shopify ads. You know, if you're launching um, a Shopify store, you're not just going to run an ad campaign for a month and say, oh, that was shit. I'm going to try something else to get traffic now. It's like there are lots of choices out there. I get that, you know, whether it's Google, whether it's Meta, whether it's TikTok. Um, but 
you've either got to do your research or frankly outsource it to someone yeah like you know if we tend to find that people are either in one of those two camps they want to find out about it and do it themselves and do a good job or they'd rather stick pins in their eyes the problems can occur if you're the minority people who are in the middle where you want to have an interest but you also want to outsource it to the heavy yeah. lifting, and then it's a bit of micromanagement and that always ends in tears. Yeah, I mean, like, kind of like the sweet spot for us with, with a Shopify store is the one, the person that's done well doing it themselves, they've got to a point where they're not doing the fulfillment anymore because it's it's outgrown that. And they also want to be hands off on the marketing. They, they, they're they like, my, my ads are running okay. I know they could be better. And I actually want to be talking to suppliers in China or wherever they're sourcing from. And looking at my margins and working on the development of the business, not spending three hours a day trying to get a better cost per click or a better cost per lead or a better cost per conversion. And that's kind of our sweet spot. But the, like you say, there's a whole spectrum. There's people who are doing literally everything. There's people who are outsourcing the fulfillment but doing everything else themselves. There's people that are outsourcing the marketing but doing everything else themselves. All the way through to like people who are now completely hands off and even the fulfillment is done overseas ordering everything we well, mentioned a couple of uh, sort of uh, number based things there what what are, when it comes to setting goals for kpis what kind of advice can we can we give to people on that front so an element of realism i think is you know especially if you're early is if you're breaking even early doors you're doing well um, that's which, gonna be tough for people. Yeah, that is tough for people to hear. But but if if you're early in the process and you're making your money back without having to have had to learn too many harsh lessons, you're doing really well, really well. Um, then the next stage is looking at your margins and almost like that profit profit first mentality. What do, what do I need to get paid? What do the team need to get paid? What do, what are my running costs? How much do I need for tax? And and like what's my emergency budget? factor all that in and then does it still sell and if the answer is yes you're doing really really well and then that's when you can scale and i think a lot of people set kpis like oh i'm managing to get a roas of 300 percent if i go to an agency they should be twice as good as me i expect 600 percent but actually it might be that it only needs to improve by 50 percent or or 10 percent even and you're covering the fee of the agency and making a whole lot more money on your side mm-hmm. because it's scalable. And what kind of people get caught up in is thinking about individual statistics and not the overall growth of the business. Right. So like a good agency should be able to say to you, not only can we help you improve your ROAS, but we can help you increase your number of second purchases, mm-hmm. third purchases, mm-hmm. upsells, cross sells. And what people don't realize is is that's available to them so like somebody buys let's think of a good example somebody buys um some like a car wash kit on your website that's quite a common one that cropped up during covid because all we had to do was wash our cars Mm. and mow our lawns so you buy a car wash kit and a really easy cross sell on that would be to sell a car wash mitt to go with the kit or to sell polish or to sell um the stuff that makes the water not stick to the car that spray you put on afterwards and but there will be for every one business doing that there'll be nine that aren't and so their kpi will be we just need to sell more of this kit Mm -hmm. so you don't need to sell more of the kit you might have saturated how many of the kit you can sell it's what else can you sell the people buying the kit so your cost per acquisition might still be 10 pound let's say but your return per acquisition goes from 15 quid to 30 quid because you sell everyone an extra widget and that that's where you need to talk to an expert about kind of like what cost your cost per click should be what your cost per conversion should be what your kpi should be what your um measured return on ad spend is versus your real return on ad spend because if you if the first purchase from someone was via an ad so you spent 10 pound to acquire someone via an ad but then they make 20 purchases across their lifetime with you. The true return on ad spend is all of those 20 purchases. 
So what's the, um, I know it's always going to depend on geography and industry and everything, but what kind of budget must people at least consider starting with? Because if someone says, right, um, no matter what their goal is, right, Joel, I've got £100 a month to spend on ads. Yeah. So this is completely plucked out of thin air, really. But I would, I would flip how people look at that. So if you've decided to set up in business on your own, so you've decided not to work for the man, for want of a better phrase, what there'll be one of two reasons normally reason number one is usually freedom it's it's not money it's it's the the ability to be your own boss mm-hmm. to decide your own hours <laughs> yeah, 20 out of 24 uh, and then and then the other is money so you know you've got the freedom that might be an illusion but let's just say you've got the freedom so what's the money so you know I think the average salary in this country is distorted, but let's say you want to make 50 grand a year in your first couple of years, which would be, you'd be going well if you if you managed to pay yourself 50 grand a year for your first two years in e-commerce. Okay, I want to pay myself 50 grand a year. Therefore, how much should I be spending on my marketing to make that happen? So I've got a 30% margin business, and I know within that 30%, I've got to pay my tax and pay myself 50 grand. So let, let you know, look, rough maths, let's say I've got to make 75 grand there. So then the other 75% is, sorry, the other 70% is, you know, I'll get myself in a hole here, but r- roughly 170 grand. Hmm. So so I've got like a 240 grand turnover hmm. that I need to meet to, to get the hmm. money out that I want. How much should I spend on marketing to make 240 grand on a 30% margin product? You, you're talking between 25 and 50 grand depending, right, okay. depending on what you're playing with not 100 quid a month though <laughs> exactly because let's face it I mean not often but sometimes we will st- still get people approach us and they want help with their Shopify ads and their budgets are like so small they, 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 they couldn't buy one night in the local newspaper yeah and for a month that's, that's just not going to work it's not. It's just not enough to make the till ring. And it's scary. Like, and I appreciate there's plenty of people out there who have got disillusioned with being employed or always intended to start up in business, and they actually don't intend to pay themselves for the first two years, and that changes the maths. But at some point, you've got to be able to pay yourself, or it's not a sustainable business. So, if you can't, like, if you're taking Shopify really seriously. But the idea of spending between one and two grand a month on ads makes you wince. You're not taking Shopify as seriously as you think you are. I mean, it's almost like in any type of business, we're massive fans of of paid for advertising. But not many forms of paid for advertising were around when, say, we start up in business. So it was legwork. And legwork can still work now. But the fact is, or the reality is, I could say this humbly, I think, not many people would do what we did. So 100, 100 calls a day on the phone, networking, evenings, weekends, driving everywhere, turning up to any meeting, going, fucking hell. And we grew our businesses that way. We couldn't scale it that way. Of course you can't, and you'll just burn out. But if you haven't got any ad budget and you want to grow a business, you've at least got to be prepared yeah. to, to, to work those 20 hours a well, day, and not that many people uh, are. Uh, yeah, and that... You've got to get in front of e-commerce. You've got to get in front of an audience, one way or another. So you might be speaking from stage in front mm. of a thousand people at the Home Expo at the NEC, whatever it's called. But they're going to charge you to be on that stage. So it's this, it's it's the same scenario, and and then you've got to encourage of that thousand people, twenty of them to visit your website and put the offer code in and make mm. the purchase. So it, you you end up in a similar place and. There, there, are, there will be examples out there of Shopify shops that have managed to grow themselves organically to a successful point, but there will have been a sacrifice they've made to do that. There will have been having to genuinely be a human live chat 24 hours or mm. having to come up with viral content every day, 365 mm. days I was about a to say year. viral content, getting in bed with influencers, somehow persuading influencers to... To do to, it for free because yeah, your yeah. product's that good. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's... Uh, I mean, you know, we love ads, but we're more than aware 
that when they're not run properly, obviously there is wastage. There's always going to be some wastage, but you know, we talk about um, those gaps. We we always say the phrase "leaving money on the table." Um, would you say that's as prevalent in the kind of ads you run to Shopify stores? Yeah, as opposed to bricks and mortar businesses. Yeah, it, the be, the amount of like businesses that we see that are either too specific with their targeting or not specific enough, and so they're just pouring mm. half their budget down the drain, or at the checkout process, like, like I mentioned before, there's no upsell or cross sell. So, or in, abandoned basket. Yeah. So increasing the ROAS, it might be that the ad campaign is pretty tidy, but the reality is you just cannot get enough volume through the till to to make it pay. Like simple things, like uh, well, the landing page we were looking at yesterday. There was only one way to pay, and that was credit card. Yeah. So what if you don't have your credit card on you? What if you can't be asked going to the next room to get it? Like, I think Shopify uses ShopPay, doesn't it? So it always pops up with that ShopPay thing. So if you've been on another Shopify, and then you you go on to this one, it remembers, it remembers you, it. And you can then pay by Apple Pay, Google Pay, credit card, PayPal, whatever, because it's remembered who you are. But if you haven't turned that feature on, you're not going to... Like, we had a client a few years back now who... It was like fifty spend over fifty pound and get free P and P, but his product cost twenty two pound. So you had to buy three to get over the threshold, and and the tactic to increase the ROAS was change that from fifty to forty because then they'll only have to buy two. Mm -hmm. You'll still be in loads of profit, but your sales will go up. So the clients wouldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, okay. Was it booze related? It was booze yeah, related. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and. And now you can actually go on Amazon and get it cheaper than his own website. I might have had a look recently. I, I, the only thing I can assume that's gone on there, because they're like one of those people that wanted to do it all themselves, is that they've bulk sold stock to a wholesaler. Oh, really? Only, they must have been sat on too much stock. Mm. Because why would you undercut yourself? Why would I buy from your website and pay for delivery when I get it free on Prime cheaper? Yeah. Uh, you see that a lot. That's very common. So there, there, there must be more. Something, yeah, there yeah. must be wholesalers out there that are willing to do bulk purchases, and you have to sign away their right yeah. to sell on Amazon. And also, there must be evidence to suggest that sometimes people will buy on Amazon, but then come direct afterwards. And you could be smart mm -hmm. about it. So, like, if for some reason you're selling for less on Amazon. But then they get a leaflet that gives them twenty percent off if they buy Coming direct. Website, yeah. you, like yeah. you, that, you could be using it as a clever market employee because the Amazon advertising platform's effective. Mm. But that's not what was going on in this case. Bloody hell! That was a long. Was that pre-COVID? Yeah. Bloody hell! But yeah, that was yeah. when we had the brick wall vinyl. <laughs> so, what other gaps uh, might there be? I mean, yeah, some of those sound really simple, but you, I mean, you've got to make it. E to make the till ring, you've got to make it easy to collect the money. Creative, that, creative gaps. That's a big one. Okay, go on. So a lot of people spend so much time talking about features or benefits, they forget to showcase the product. And sometimes it, it's just a case that the product looks lovely and that's why people want it. So I, that, that'll happen time and again. Like I, I've seen Pick and Mix is a great example of this at the moment. There are pick and mix companies out there that will sell you a massive tub of mixed pick and mix there are some now that are doing these dishes that look like a pizza and in each triangle of so like a nacho dish in each triangle is a different suite and then right. they put the lid on same product delivered differently one's charging twice as much as the other wow. Yeah. and it, all that is is a packaging tactic right? you know a lot about pick and mix don't you all I get served on TikTok is wrestling Pick a mix and motivational quotes. Bloody hell. Yeah. And what about, I mean, let's talk about your favourite subject now, AI. Um, I mean, obviously everyone's talking about AI. From what from what I can see, most people are using it badly. You can spot it a mile yeah. off. Uh, like, like any tool, it is just a tool. And it can be used well and it can be used badly. Um, would it be fair to say that it is a game changer when it comes to optimising your ads? Well, yeah. I mean, both Google and Meta have AI built in now. So you can 
uh, for example, you could put in your four headlines, your four pieces of copy, and your four potential images, and Facebook would decide, Meta would decide, which ones are going to get you the mm -hmm. best cost per conversion or cost per click. Not on a on a wholesale basis, but on an individual basis. So it's like, we have enough data on Andy Rye that we know serving him a yellow advert with with a headline that says new and short form copy is more likely to make him buy than serving him a green advert with a headline that says all new and a long form copy. If you want me to explain that more, I'm not going to, not on a podcast, but that's how clever the AI is getting there. The other thing you can do, if, if once you've got to a place where you're like, well, this creative and this set of headlines is really performing for me, you could go into a tool like ChatGPT or a tool like Claude and put in the three best performing headlines from your campaign. So these three headlines outperform my other headlines 10 to 1. Please create me five other suggested headlines that follow the same format and tonality as these ones. And it will. That never existed before. You needed a geek in the office to do that for you before. So why would you say so many people are doing it badly? Poor input. So shit in, shit out. That's what I say. Yeah, and magic pill hunting again. So, like, oh, I've got a Black Friday offer coming up. I've posted it on all my socials, and I've ran an ad to my Black Friday offer. Okay, show me the ad. Headline: Black Friday offer. Okay, well you've just immediately got lost in all the other Black Friday offers. What does the creative say? Black Friday offer. Okay, fucking hell. What does what does the copy say? Well, the top says Black Friday offer. Well, you've already said that in the headline, and you've already said it in the creative. And I appreciate that you got you've gone right. I need to do some marketing. I need to run an ad. It's a Black Friday offer. But what you haven't done is, how am I going to differentiate from everyone else making noise this time of year? How am I going to hook people in with a headline that resonates with them? And how is the copy going to demonstrate to them that not only are they making a good decision, but it's a decision that has very little risk on mm -hmm. their part? And I mean, like, it's a great time of year for me and you at the minute, because I'm screenshotting ads every day, good and bad. And like, we're sort of building up a portfolio of ads. And me and you were looking at one yesterday by a, a well-known SEO company. And, and the way they'd done it was they tackled the three main pain points of SEO, crossed them out, and then said what theirs does. I was like, well, that's mm -hmm. simple and effective. I tell you, as a, well, I say as a designer, you're the designer, not me, but as, as, as a marketer well-versed in design, it's quite a bitter pill to swallow that the days of those super stylized photos in ad creatives might not always be working the best. Sometimes it's the most basic ad designs. Oh, I, that will work, I, I feel like we're seeing that return. repeated on TV. That there's one ad doing the rounds at the moment. I can't remember. They sell they sell used cars, and um, their logo is like it. I mean, it could be like a UKIP convention. It's like a a sort of silhouette of a car on a British flag in an oval shape, and it it's a crap looking ad. So you you can't say the name, or you can't remember who it is. Probably both. Oh, okay. <laughs> But when the ad comes on, it's silent. So you'll be sat chatting when the ads come on, because everyone will you know, get up to make a cup of tea or whatever. And the telly goes silent. You think the telly's broken? And you turn and you see the logo and you're like, fucking hell. Oh, I've seen that. And like, they've obviously cottoned on that the best way to kind of stop the scroll, or in this case, mm. uh, to grab attention, is to have a silent advert. And then, like, I think now we're sort of maybe john lewis is is like they were doing ultra polished adverts and then this year is a, a venus flytrap singing singing in the garden it's like they they've realized that attention spans have got shorter and they need to do something that has instant recall so so i was in london with friends not last weekend the weekend before so a couple of weeks ago and that's why I first saw the John Lewis ad. And my mate Brian said, oh, yeah, that's the shortened version. I was like, what? And so they're already showing an abridged version in, like, mid-November. And like I say... Yeah, the shortened one is just it, churning out some presents in yeah, the garden. Yeah, and it's yeah, just yeah. like, fucking hell. But I guess that's the TikTok generation. 
that you know the latest i talked about this recently on another video um the the most recent marvel film is just 100 minutes long and you know you compare that to scorsese's film the, the flower moon flower moon thing that's 200 minutes long so you're essentially getting twice the value for money but the way people are seeing it now it's half of my time if I go and see the Marvel one. So it's not just money people are looking at, it's time. And that, that atten attention's a currency of marketing. But attention spans are so fucking short. Rid well, Ridley Scott's just come, because Napoleon's just come out and he's just said, I've never made a film over three hours because you're getting into achy bum time. And ultimately, it's another reason for people not to buy a ticket. Well, The Irishman, I love Scorsese, still haven't seen it. It's been saved on my Netflix, Netflix yeah, watch same. list for ages because... I can't devote three and a half hours. I could do it in installments, I guess, but it's like I'd rather spend that time with Emma and the kids or on the business, and it's it's fucking, it's a hard sell. So my, my daughter, Holly, who is now 13, very hard to get her to watch any film. So our, our family film time is now a family TV time. So we'll binge like a, a TV series like we're doing The Rookie at the moment. So she can just about cope with sort of 45, so if I fast forward through the ads, 45 minutes. But she gets a bit jumpy after that and i think so ads you said stopping the scroll um just getting that attention it's just becoming more and more of a challenge but you know an exciting one but if you're doing what you did a year ago chances are you ain't getting the results you were a year ago yeah and it's it's sad because like there's an element of mar all marketers that are storytellers and that skill set's being taken away from us like the time the time you need to invest to to effectively tell a story is not available to you anymore so you've seen the short version of the john lewis advert that doesn't explain that the kid thought he was buying a christmas tree not a venus flytrap oh uh, okay um uh. and so and like the coca-cola advert it used to be that there was like these lights coming in the forest of far, like in the far off distance and then there was people coming out to see what it is and then eventually it builds on this like crescendo and holidays are coming da, 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 da. now you, very often it's just the back of the lorry with santa holding up the coke at the end mm. because people just and the recall's still there and, and the advertisers know that so they're like well we still got coke in front of people during prime time yeah the other it's, minute wasn't necessary it's like i read i can't remember the fucking number now i read a, st a statistic about the number of people who listen to podcast and audiobooks on one and a half times speed yeah just so they can get it done quicker and it's like i've never I, done that no i well i've never even thought about it but it's like shit that's like yeah i mean i can understand if you're listening to bloody arnie's book that i think six hours on order he talks slowly as well so no i suppose so maybe you could <laughs> you speak if you sped him up he might sound normal <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it's th but there's no point moaning about it. The facts are the facts, and you've got to follow the facts and follow the money. So by saying, oh, it's not, you know, you mentioned entitlement back at the beginning, say, oh, it's not fair that people have got bigger budgets than me. It's not fair that attention spans are low and I've got to work harder to grab that attention. It's just, well, that's the that's fucking way it is. With. Control the controls. What have you got in your control that you can learn, you can deploy, outsource, whatever it might be? to ensure that you keep getting well, like the biggest a, bang for your buck. A massive one recently that just fucking blew up out of nowhere was like these um, organic soaps and deodorants. They just... Oh, okay. Like, I tried one of them. It didn't work. Well, yeah. It I, kept, it, I get on the stick and it just kept breaking. It was shit. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. But what they clocked was that if the marketing was cool and like exciting and, and attention-grabbing, they could charge four times as much as a shop bought deodorant and people would still pay it and then they were doing it on subscription as well so you would like once you're okay. in you're in and that's that's smart where you're like i'm not competing with links and shore and sanex and whatever the other deodorant brands are called i've got an extra large links africa have you <laughs> i'm allergic to links you're joking? Yeah. So, like, no. every Christmas for someone... I just thought you were shit with women. So <laughs> Yeah. I don't have the links effect purely because <laughs> I don't wear links. That's what it was. You were li literally... Yeah. Every other um, deodorant's fine? Yeah. I wonder what is in links, then. I don't know. It may, the yeah. animal magnetism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, th this guy's got enough of the links effect already. <laughs> That's what it was. We need to bottle Joel in the spray. Imagine that, yeah. fucking hell. God. What is, what's it smell of? Hard work. <laughs> what does this smell like? Stress. <laughs> <laughs> Stress and sweat. 
So, um, no, yeah, they they figured out that people would pay a premium for something because they felt like it was all natural and mm. it was cool. And like, I think one of the brands is called Do- Doctor Squatch, and it's a monkey. And like, how much then for a deodorant? I think I think it was like fifteen quid a stick. Shit. So like, yeah. So my giant Lynx Africa, I think, was like three quid. Yeah. Bloody hell! Right? 50, yeah, so fifteen quid a stick. But yeah, it's like well, no point being in the middle. And people bought it. People, nice. People bought it, and I mean, I'm sure they've got venture capitalists and investors now, but what they wouldn't have done to start. Well, I mean, we we know a guy who did similar with hair products. Yes. And um, he went down the route of they were all like London gangster themed, mm. and he charged a premium, and he was selling on Amazon and Shopify. Can't get away from Amazon now. Doing really well, I think. Yeah, really well. And, uh, so what do you say to people who are selling widgets that are everywhere for around the same price? If, if you're buying them for less than everyone else, power to you. Um, and only you will know that. If you're, like, like what's a good, a good example at, at the minute of a widget that might, everyone might sell? Like tea towels? Tea towels would be a pretty standard widget that everyone sells you you're on a hide into nothing it, if you unless your margins are there you're on a hide into nothing so you've got to have a think about right okay well currently i i get these tea towels manufactured i'm breaking even but the reason i'm breaking even is there's no no margin in it for me or i'm making a small loss what can I do to differentiate here? So, and, and there'll be like three things. You can do it cheaper, um, which is hard. It's particularly hard if you want to run a marketing campaign behind it, if you want to be the cheapest. Because what you'll find with with cheap brands or budget brands is that they normally rein in their advertising in order, in order to squeeze the the margin Mm -hmm. so you won't see many adverts for like a b&m bargains on tv for example or on online um you can go ultra expensive so you could be like right we're gonna we're gonna do microfiber tea towels with a 500 use promise or you can differentiate and the differentiating thing would be like how dyson did it in in vacuum cleaners so it'd be like get your dishes dry in half the time and so you've you've patented something mm-hmm. in the tea towel world that makes your tea towel twice as absorbent as the normal tea towel what a lot of businesses will do is grit their teeth and just try and sell more mm-hmm. tea towels and it isn't going to happen what businesses that aren't in a position to either slash their margins charge way more or differentiate do effectively sometimes is they come up with a a unique selling proposition so um it would be subscribe to our tea towels and get get a random tea towel every month so maybe this month you get a shropshire tea towel and next month you get a yorkshire tea towel or whatever um and we saw t-shirts do that for quite well for a oh, while yes, yeah, yeah. seems to have slowed off now the subscription model a uh, bit just fast fashion isn't it it's all getting tired of that brush yeah so so there are ways around it but I, I would say if you know you've got a good product think about what your selling proposition is and that pick and mix example i used before of two companies selling exactly the same thing but one sells it in a big tub piled high and the other sells it in what looks like a pizza where it's all separated out nicely, it makes better content, so you get a better ROAS because your organic content boosts mm-hmm. your paid content. You get more second-time purchases because it makes a great gift as opposed to giving someone a massive tub of sweets. And like, and all they've done is pay a little bit more for their packaging. I'm just thinking about that Only Fools and Horses episode where Mike, the pub owner, gives Dell some beef stew for two quid. Then he calls over to some yuppie in the corner. So your birth beginion and charges him a fiver. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, just just good marketing that is. So yeah, a point of differentiation. Um, if if you if you look, feel, and sound like everyone else, people are just going to want to pay the same price, or they're just trying to batter you down on price. Yeah. And and if you're the cheapest and sell at volume and there's enough of a margin, then then okay, hats off to you. 
But generally speaking, it's just a race to the bottom. And of course, there's no loyalty. If you sell something for a pound and then someone starts selling it for 99p, chances are a lot of your customers yeah. are going to go to save themselves a penny. And, and like the reality is a lot of the food that M&S stocks in the frozen section is the same food as Iceland stock, but it's packaged differently. Different people in the shop, some might say. Well, yeah. That's but, the, but the, the shop but experience. That's the proposition is also who you're putting it in front of, right? So... I just, so I just got me thinking. I was thinking about my grandma the other day. Um, she she was from India. Can, can, uh, her parents were converted by missionaries. So very British and very proud about about the British Raj and all that stuff. Um, so whenever she came over here, even though Air India was like a fraction of the price and would get here in the same time, she'd only ever fly British Airways. <laughs> and it's like no other one had to be British Airways, and it's just like yeah, funny. I thought about thought about that recently, but yeah, just so so funny that some people they'll they'll pay more. Like my mother in law loves shopping in Marks and Spencers, and even though she can get the same stuff in Iceland, for example, she'd rather pay more to go in M and S for call it the experience, what whatever you yeah. want to call it. But some people will pay more for that, and that's the same thing as well. We see that rife in the gym world. It's like. Same same equipment, generally speaking, same treadmill, same weights, but some people would rather pay five times the price to be in one gym compared to another. Yeah, and neither are wrong. Absolutely. And that's that's what you're dealing with. So if you set up your proposition, you've got to really think about front and centre who your customer is because there are people who, like, can you come back to the example, there's people who want to just buy a massive tub of pick and mix and there's people who want to buy a gift of pick and mix and they're not the same. Mm-hmm. Giant toe brewing, that's the way forward. Nice. That's a, yeah, if you want to treat Andy on the 4th of December, that's the that's the way forward. What do people need to do if they want to know a bit more about Shopify ads and the like? Visit cobreak.co.uk. Wicked. Take care, everyone.